What's going on guys? Welcome back to Country Bunkers Trains. We got a bit of a different video today. A little while back I posted a video, a short little clip showing of a layout expansion that I was working on for my second layout. In that video I showed the raised deck that I had added to the layout and this is part two to that video. I've put all the meat and potatoes into this video. <laughs> it's a little bit longer but I think it's worthwhile. In this video, I installed the new line on the raised, the new raised section of track, as well as a raised line that you can see behind me all connected. You'll notice two reoccurring themes uh, throughout this video and while I'll build my layouts. The first being simplicity. I don't go all out. This isn't a high rail layout. Think of this as a toy train layout, if you will, because that's what it is, really. Post-war style, in a sense. Uh, the second theme you'll notice is a uh, budget. It's very budget friendly. Uh, none of this is super expensive. It's a great way to get into the hobby as well as, you know, have fun with the hobby. But anyways, guys, I hope you enjoy this. Like I say, it's a little bit longer, so sit back and enjoy. Thank you. Is there anything better than getting train goodies in the mail? <laughs> I don't think so. It's like Christmas all over again, especially when you get some big boxes like these. Lots of good stuff hiding inside. The first item to tackle was installing the new bridge. Unfortunately, I couldn't use the piers that are supplied with the bridge, as this was going over existing track that was already on the layout. I make up my own out of some 1x2 wood that I'll get into later. Unfortunately, I didn't get any video footage of the bridge going up. I forgot to take, <laughs> take some video. But you'll see the finished result here. Guys, this bridge is sick. Check this thing out. Looks awesome. I was originally planning on doing another dog bone like I did with this track right here. Having a smaller bridge with a couple switches going from the table over here out to a loop over here. But I opted to go with this two-track bridge from MTH. I think it was the right call. This will offer a lot more uh, impression or wow factor. <laughs> this thing looks great. And she's, uh, we got her sturdy mounted to the table. Everything's screwed in. She's not going anywhere. I have to do that because we have two little hellions running around that love to rip everything up. Yeah, I see you. <laughs> A little prick. <laughs> he loves woodland scenic trees and brush. I can't have any of it on the layout without him getting to it. Alrighty guys, the next thing on the agenda is ground cover. Me, personally, I, I take the cheap and easy way out. I use this ready grass grass roll from Woodland Scenics, uh, the spring grass flavor. The, it comes in many different shades and colors, summer grass, spring grass, fall. I think they even offer a uh, snow mat. As I say, this is the, uh, the cheap and easy alternative. A lot of high-end modelers or high railers We'll do all their track work first, lay down road bed, their track on top, and then do static grass and all the other different flavors and varieties of grass on top of it. And it does look great. But like I say, I, I prefer to keep it simple. I don't go that far into it. I don't go all out. That's what I've used all throughout this layout. I did use the summer grass on that layout when I started out. But it was, uh, it was a little lackluster. It was a little too brown. The one thing I do prefer with this grass mat over the static grass is the ability for change. Although I consider these layouts permanent, I've realized nothing is forever. For instance, this layout over here, I've redone two, three times since it's been up. If I were doing static grass and such stuff like that, whenever I was changing the track track work or layout, all that grass would have to be ripped up and changed and redone. This stuff is simple and easy. You just pull the track up and put it in its new spot. Only thing I got to worry about is uh, the holes that's left from the wiring and whatnot. 
And all that's hidden very easily uh, with buildings, trees, uh, any kind of scen scenic work. That's why I like it. That's what I prefer. And it's very easy to work with. Obviously, you just unroll it. I use these uh, carpet tacks to hold it in place. You can see it here. Now, you can do carpet sound insulation or sound deadener under it, which I've done. Uh, but the stuff I used previously, I, I wasn't that impressed with. So I opted out not using it. Alrighty, here's the layout with its fresh new uh, fresh new turf. Looks a lot better, doesn't it? <laughs> Obviously, this stuff comes in a roll, so it's going to be kind of a bear. You're going to have some wrinkles here and there. But I find usually after a couple days, it'll settle and go away. After a couple days, if it's still there and it's bugging you, you can pull the tax back up and restretch it out if you want, but... I prefer to leave it. I mean, as we know, in real world, the ground isn't perfectly flat, so this helps add a little bit to it. <clears throat> Here it is versus the older stuff on the layout. You can tell it is a little bit greener. This stuff is a bear to clean. <clears throat> Dust gets on it, pet hair, stuff like that. You can vacuum it off, but you got to be pretty gentle with it because you start putting nicks in it the grass starts coming up off of the mat. I do plan on either putting a mountain siding or a rock wall, something here. This will be a tunnel. All this track and stuff under here won't be exposed. I do want to say you can come back and do static grass on top of this, I believe. I've even done the uh, murky water from Woodland Scenics on top of it over on the other layout as well. And I had no issues with it. I just put a acrylic paint seat to seal the grass and poured the water on top of it. And it worked fairly well. That's why I like it. It's, it's very easy to work with. The next item to take care of is our supports or trestles for the raised track. I picked the uh, probably the easiest and simplest way to do this. All this is is one by two uh, wood that I've picked up from the local Home Depot. I measure and cut the size. Please excuse the rain. I'm out here cutting these obviously on my chop saw. But yeah, I get my measurements, make sure everything's good to go. Uh, how high these got to be, how wide they got to be. Obviously, that's the most important factor. A, making sure these are high enough for your trains to sneak under, that'll be running underneath the raised track, as well as the width. I found that out the hard way. You want to make these wide enough for your engines, especially around curves, uh, for your engines to clear these as they're running around underneath them. I'll give you an example of that here in a minute. But once I do get these cut, all I do is uh, give them a quick coat of Rust-Oleum Black, and they're good to go once they're dry. As I say, very easy, very simple, nothing special. There's many ways you can go about doing this and get as classy or fancy as you want to get. <laughs> but in the spirit of a toy train layout, this is what we'll use. Here's an example of a few of them finished on the layout. These ones are waiting their final placement. I'm kind of on hold. My track was supposed to show up yesterday, however FedEx has taken their sweet time. Here's an example of what we were talking about earlier with clearance. As I say, we could have saved a little bit of material and put a support right here. However, then we're running the risk of an engine, a bigger engine on this inner loop, running into it, or possibly bigger passenger cars, or another big engine sideswiping it over here. Rather than take our chances, I just made it a little bit bigger. Span both the tracks. I've had issues in the past. So I don't want to I don't want to deal with it again. Maybe we'll put some floodlights up here or something to shine on the trains as they're running by. Make it a little make it look a little less naked. But yeah, these are fairly simple. They just get screwed together over here on the ends. And then I come back and uh screw them to the table from underneath. I mark where they're going, drill a hole, 
and then I come up from underneath and screw up into these so they don't go anywhere. You don't want a loose upper track. <laughs> you don't want to risk an engine running off your rails and falling off the table. That would be no bueno. But it's coming along. Still got a good little bit of work to do. Well, it's day three after work. As you can see, I've made a little bit of progress. I got these placed where they're going using the uh, the track that was already mounted as a reference point. I'm going to have to pick up some more wood. I, I used it all up. They're, they're nice and sturdy, good to go. The only ones not mounted are these three smaller ones back here. I was waiting on the track uh, before I mounted them, make sure it was going to work and line up. The big news, however, FedEx finally dropped our track off. Woohoo! It's been stuck in Georgia for the last three days. I've been waiting on it. If you can't guess, obviously, Menard's track, once again. Awesome stuff. Let's open it up and take a peek. I shot a couple of videos a while ago when I started expanding and building this, this layout. I was showing off the Menards track. There seemed to be quite a bit of interest in this track. Uh, a lot of people seemed very interested in it. I figured this go around, we'd take a quicker or a closer look at it so people could get a better idea of it. It is a great track system. I like it. But yeah, let me get it out of the box here and we'll take a peek at it. Did a pretty decent job at packing it. It's the straights, the curves. We got some 30 inch straight sections here. Very nice. Well, here's what it looks like once you get it all unpacked. Depending, of course, upon what you order. <laughs> As you can see, I ordered one case of 10 inch straights, 24 pieces. A case of 042 curves, again, 24 pieces. As well as eight sections of 30 inch straights. I really like this stuff. This stuff is great. The best thing about this, it's very, very, very budget friendly. You can't beat the price. To put it in perspective, this case of 042 curves is about 45 bucks, and it gives you enough to do two 042 curves. If you want to compare that to the MTH real tracks, uh, the price is about 60 to 65 dollars to do one complete circle. That'll give you an idea of a uh, price comparison. Now, obviously, like everything else in the hobby, uh, this stuff is subjective. If you're looking to do a high rail layout, this isn't something you'd probably be looking to use. Again, not to scale. It's very tall. I mean, it's basically old Lionel post war track. It's not for everybody. Understandable. But as I say, I really like it. <clears throat> I was reading when this stuff came out, a lot of people were saying, you know, it doesn't look like the old Lionel track. It looks foggier. It looks this. It looks that. Well, here's a section of uh, original post-war Lionel tubular track. I mean, hell, what's there to complain about? <laughs> I like going with the Menard stuff. Yeah, it's China made, but it looks a hell of a lot better. The one thing I do really like about this track and what makes it stick out for doing a race track is how rigid and sturdy it is. Having these solid steel pins, again like the old Lionel track, it makes for a great mechanical connection, very strong and rigid. You don't got to worry about it flexing or bending. It's strong stuff. And this works out really good, like I say, if you're doing a race track you can span your supports or trestles a little bit further apart without worrying too much about it. 
the MTH real tracks kind of suffers in that department. It's plastic and the, it's not as solid as a connection. You can see it wants to bend. And this can pose a problem if you're putting raised track up on a, a busy section of the layout. I have that issue over here. I couldn't really put a support right here, so it's pretty weak. Start running heavier equipment on it, you can see it wants to bend and fall. Obviously I could fix that, but that'd be a huge trestle spanning from all the way over here to over here. That's just not something I wanted to do. But as I say, this stuff, no problem. Nice and sturdy, it ain't going nowhere. It's great. For powering this track, you can use the good old Lionel lock-ons and hook them onto the track. I believe Menards also sells these as well that clip onto the track and you can run your wires to. <clears throat> However, I found if you're building a permanent layout or at least a track layout that's going to stay there for a while, this is not perfectly ideal. Vibrations from the train cause these to move and they start to wreak a little havoc. I've gotten away from doing that. The cheap and easy solution, which is what I do, is solder the wires on the bottom side of the track. I'll take a little sandpaper and scrub the finish off for the solder to stick on the inner rail and the outside rail and just solder the wires straight to the, uh, straight to the track. And then when I figure out where it's going to go on the layout, I'll drill a hole right there and run the wiring underneath the layout. It's the easiest and simple, simplest solution. And it works quite well. <clears throat> I put feeder wires about every 10 feet or so throughout the layout for good power distribution. Now, of course, you can't have your cake and eat it too. <laughs> like everything else, there's a, there's a give and take. The one issue that this track does have is it doesn't conduct power near as well as the MTH real tracks. These connectors or pins, although are nice and tight and aren't coming in or out, they do spin. And this wreaks havoc on the electrical. Granted, these are brand new out of the box. I usually take a pair of pliers and squeeze these a little bit tighter, the tracks or the rails, and make sure these are nice and tight. I'll get them to the point, again, they won't slide in or out, but they'll still spin. This doesn't bode well for a good electrical connection. The real tracks, let me grab a light, uses these copper or brass fingers that slide up against each other. This real tracks works great for conducting the electrical. <clears throat> to give you an idea, this whole outer main line is powered by one singular lock on right there. Now granted, this isn't a huge layout, but this is probably 45-50 feet of track in one run. And I can run the trains with no issues. They don't slow down anywhere. I don't have any power loss anywhere. It works great. <clears throat> I can't say the same with the Menards track. You can see this upper loop quite a bit smaller. However, I have to have, uh, I've got two power sources on this track. Again, over here. But I noticed over here, the trains would start losing power. They'd start slowing down. So I had to, uh, I had to run a feeder wire over there. And it works good. It's just a little bit more work, but I think it's worthwhile. Again, when you're comparing prices, this MTH track, as I say, is 60 65 bucks for one circle of 042. You can imagine what it would cost to do this whole, this whole layout over here with that stuff. It gets pretty expensive. So as I say, like with everything else, you take the good with the bad. Learn to live with it and how to deal with it. One last small little issue I've run into with this stuff is the little insulators on the inner rail. It doesn't happen often. It's not a reoccurring issue, but it has happened, and it's something to watch out for when you're setting your layout up. These insulators, I've seen them a couple times where they're folded up, and the tab that bends over them is touching the rail, causing a short. It can be a huge pain in the ass <laughs> once you have all your track work laid. You put a transformer to it with nothing on it, and it's throwing the breaker. It's fun going through all the track trying to find it. But as I say, it's not a very common issue. 
I haven't had it happen many times, but it has happened. And as I say, it's, it's just best to check it out while you're laying it and putting your track together. I like to keep it old school, and I screw all of my track work to the, uh, to the layout. A lot of the high railers or, hell, any other model railroaders will glue a roadbed down to the table and then glue the track to the roadbed, not running any screws in an effort to keep the layout as quiet as possible. <laughs> as I say, I, I don't go that far with it. I don't like my track being able to move. And like I say, I, we got two cats that love to get up here and move stuff around. It's not very fun. But with the screws, you're not worrying about it. The whole the whole layout's moving with the track. It ain't going nowhere. But again, do what works for you. Do what you like. As I say, nothing's right, nothing's wrong. It's whatever you prefer. I'm going to go ahead and get started laying some track. Uh, hopefully I'll have an update later on tonight. I don't know how far I'll get. Like I say, i got to get some more wood to make some more trestles. But we'll see what we can get accomplished. But we're getting there. Stay tuned. Alrighty, guys. Well, I got the new track test fit. Everything's fitting pretty good. Looking pretty sweet. I don't think I'm going to have to get any more wood either. I think I'll just do these tees. It seems to be good enough. <clears throat> Everything's fitting together well and like I say looking good. Got a little bit of a bend. I'll have to play with that in the bridge uh, when I go to screw everything down. <clears throat> I do have one engine in mind for this new track and that's my big old E8 that I just got a little while back. This poor thing's just a little too big. It's kind of stuck to two two lines right now. I can only run it on this main line and this upper line over here. Everywhere else it gets stuck. It's just so big. <laughs> but it should look pretty good up here. And it, it seems to be clearing. I thought I was going to have to move my signal over here. But it seems to be clearing it with no problems. A little close. But we're good. Goes into the bridge with no issue. Very nice. <clears throat> this did give me a chance to, to test my actual layout. <laughs> it held my fat ass, so we're doing alright. If it can hold me, it'll have no problem with these little trains. We'll go ahead and start getting her wired up. I did also want to mention... It is fairly easy to cut this stuff to size if needed. Cut it with a hacksaw or a grind off or a cutting wheel, sorry. It's very easy to cut the size however you need. It also hooks right up to original Lionel tubular track as well. As you can see, that's what this is in front of it. Luckily, I didn't have to cut any of this. I have a surplus of old post war track. I was having some issues on the bridge. <clears throat> Uh, the pieces I got just weren't fitting right, but I had these goofy sized post-war tracks in my collection, and two of them fit the bill just perfectly. No, they don't look great, but they do work, and it'll be hidden on the bridge. You won't see it, so we should be all right. As long as it flows current fairly well, we'll be all right. But we'll have enough feeders, like I say, with power. It shouldn't be an issue. It's day four now, getting back on it, making some progress. You know, normally this wouldn't take quite as long. However, I'm at the mercy of the shipping companies. That's what's been my holdup, waiting for everything to get here. But I mean, half the funds uh, the, is in the building of the layout, isn't it? So I'm enjoying it. As you can see... This side of the expansion is all done. Everything's finalized, it's in place, track is mounted, working out good. 
I installed two feeder wires so far, or power connections, one back there by the window and one right here by this support. I did get these tees made up last night and got, a, got them painted. I think they'll work. Doesn't seem to pose any issues. It's a little bit of a long span right here, but as I say, this stuff's nice and solid and rigid. It's not going anywhere. We're kind of on the home stretch now. All I got left is securing this track down and running some more feeder wires over here to power it. I do have a little, uh, a little work to do. I got to loosen this tie right here and scoot it back some onto this support. And probably do the same on the back uh, track as well. But that's nothing. We'll get that done in short order. But yeah, like I say, we're on the home stretch. Hopefully tonight we'll have it powered up and we'll start doing some testing. Well guys, it's finally installed. She's up. Got everything screwed down, securely mounted. She's just about ready to run. Got our feeder wires installed for power. We can finally move on to the next step which is wiring it up. You'll have all your wires coming out underneath the layout, obviously. Easiest and most simple way is using a terminal block. I like using these MTH ones. These are nice pieces. Obviously, you can get these from other manufacturers for cheaper on eBay and such, but I've had very good luck with these, and that's why I like using them. They, too, they do come in two varieties. You can get a 12 port, which is what I would have liked to use, and a 24 port, which is what I have. I was having a hard time finding a 12 port one. Seems like they're in high demand. I'll probably switch this one out in the future. It's obviously a little overkill. This will get used for accessories in the future probably. For wiring, I like to use either 14 or 16 gauge. Uh, but the place where I get my wiring had this 18 gauge on, on sale. I couldn't pass it up. I figure we'll give it a try. We should be alright. It's a little thin. I like it, like I say, 14 or 16. But as I say, we shouldn't have any issues. Once I get it mounted under the table and start screwing these wires in, I'll trim the excess off. I'll, I'll leave a little bit of slack for future movement. But you don't want to leave a bunch of slack on the wires. Again, that, that kills more power, more power loss. But yeah, I'll, uh, I'll get this stuff wired up and we'll go move on to uh, testing the track. Getting pretty excited. All right, guys, I think we're finally ready to test it out. <clears throat> I wish we could say we got here without incident. However, such is life. <laughs> that is not the case. I got all my wires hooked up to my terminal block, and uh, everything was looking good. I got the uh, power turned on, and immediately it started tripping the breaker. Son of a... I thought for sure it was the Menards track, like I had spoken about previously with these insulators. I thought one with these tabs was touching somewhere. However, it was not... It was a user error, which is nine times out of ten what happens. <laughs> Before I explain, I want to make note, all three of these lines, the outer, the inner, and now the upper, are running on the same singular port on the TIU, running off of a 135-watt Lionel-powered brick. Uh, that, it's not ideal, but that's how it's running at the moment. But anyway, I got all the wires together on that terminal block, and as I mentioned previously, this is my first time using a 24-port terminal block. I'm used to using the 12-port. I assumed, you know, you got your, your hot and your 12 and 12 ports, your neutral 12 and 12. I assumed all of these were hot and all of these were neutral. However, that's not the case. They're on separate banks. This hot... This hot here is on the same bank as this neutral, and this hot is on the same bank as this neutral. I had all my wires 
running to the outside, except for one. I've got one feeder wire on the outer loop <clears throat> that serves as a feeder, but also powers my toggle switch right here for my siding to turn it on, on and off. So I had the 12 ports on the outside all filled up except for that one feeder which was on the inside bank of the positive side or the hot side. That was causing the short. It took me about 45 minutes and a lot of very choice words, but we finally figured it out. She's currently powered up right now and we're not tripping the breaker anymore. I think we're good to go. Let's go ahead and give it a try. Are you guys as excited as me? <laughs> I'm ready to see this thing run. Let's try her out. We have success. It works.
I hope you guys enjoyed this little clip. I do apologize if it seemed a little spotty in areas. I had a lot to say and I wanted to show, but I was trying to keep it as short and sweet as possible. I mentioned early on this is more on the budget side of the hobby, but to give you an idea, I'm all in for about 580 bucks on this little project. That includes all the wood, the track. Obviously, the bridge was the biggest expense, but I think it was worthwhile. And obviously, I still have a lot of work to do on this layout. This is just one small part of an ever-growing project. <laughs> but I'm real tickled with how it came out. I'm real happy with it, and I'm glad to have another line running on the layout. Can't have enough of them here. But as I say, uh, I do hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. It would be much appreciated. Until next time, guys, take care. I'll see you next time. This is Country Bunkers Trains, and my name is Zach. Have a good one.